Hi, everyone. My name is Roxy Light. I'm also ZombieZen on GitHub. If you want to follow along, the slides are available on my blog, which you can find at 256lights.com. Today, I'm going to be talking about how I built a Lua interpreter in Go and why I had a good time with it. I'm not the first person to write a Lua interpreter in Go, and chances are you probably won't end up writing one. But I always find it neat how Go works for things that aren't enterprise-y HTTP RPC servers. So quickly, why did I do this? Well, I'm writing a build tool called ZB, which is pretty cool. You should check it out. In ZB, I wanted to give users a full scripting language to write their build targets in. Thing is, I needed some custom hooks that existing Lua interpreters didn't have. Namely, I needed to store dependency information in strings. By doing this, users don't have to write out an explicit dependency list for their build targets. You might be familiar with this technique if you've used Terraform or Nix. Long story short, I picked Lua. The reference implementation of Lua is written in C and is called PUC Rio Lua after the university that published it. My implementation follows PUC Rio Lua for some parts but diverges for completely for others. If you haven't written an interpreter before, creating one may seem really daunting. Don't worry, I got you. At a high level, it's three steps. Lexing, parsing, and executing. There's a lot of elbow grease that doesn't fit in this talk, but you can read my blog post for more of that. I split each of the steps into separate Go packages. Step one, read from an io.reader and split into words. Think of this like a streaming strings.fields function. Step two, parse the tokens into bytecode, which is represented as a slice of uint32. More on that in a moment. And step three, run that bytecode. Go's packages rock to keep implementation details of each part of this process hidden from the other parts. I can even parse the bytecode without having an interpreter, which is something that you can't do in, with PUC Rio Lua. Now that we've gone through the overview, let's zoom into steps one and two. On the top, we have some Lua source code. In step one, the Lua Lex package, we split up the source into tokens. This is a term of art for words, punctuation, numbers, and string literals. We also strip out comments during this step. In step two, the Lua code package, we turn the tokens into instructions. Again, these are UN32s, uh, UN32s under the hood, but in this talk, I'll show you them in disassembly. So from top to bottom, these instructions mean load 42 into register 0, add 3 to the value in register 0, and store it into register 1. And finally, if the values weren't numbers, call the meta method add, which is represented as an enum 6. Wait, values weren't numbers. What else can they be, you may be asking. Well, let's talk a little bit about Lua's types and the type system. You've got nil, booleans, numbers, strings, which remember is the whole motivating example for this, where we're adding dependency information to it. User data, which is just an opaque Go value, which is useful for sort of embedding things and such. Tables, which are basically map of value to value, but my implementation makes them ordered for determinism reasons. And Lua functions, which are mostly a list of UN32s, the bytecode that we got from the previous step. And Go functions. In the PUC Rio Lua implementation, a value is a complex C union with a lot of branching, preprocessor macros, that sort of thing. What rocks is that in Go, I can use an interface type and have methods like string conversion on each value type. Now that we have our bytecode and our data types ready to go, we're on to step three, bytecode execution. In a lightning talk, there isn't enough time to go into how this works in depth, but if you're interested, you can go read my blog post. At a high level, we do a for loop over the bytecode list and switch on the bottom seven opcode bits from the current bytecode. Standard Lua uses about 80 different opcodes, so in the real program, that's about 80 different switch cases, which obviously would not fit on this slide. That's the elbow grease that I was talking about earlier. Each case does an operation, then moves the program counter forward. Fairly box standard code, right? Nothing that Go helps us with? Wrong. Turns out the Go compiler optimizes this sort of giant switch statement using a technique called jump tables. So I can write this giant switch statement, and Go helps make this faster than writing a bunch of individual if statements. Cool. So to recap, Go packages made it easy to organize code, the type system eliminated the need for a lot of the bookkeeping code in PUC Rio Lua, and the compiler made my code performant without having me jump through hopes. I feel like I'm missing something. Oh, right, testing. For such a complicated project, it was critical to be testing frequently, and Go's testing package helped me spot check all sorts of things along the way. For example, I used the Go comp package to quickly spot bugs in my parser by comparing my parser's output with the output from the POC Rio Lua parser. Something else that really helped, Go's built-in performance tools. I don't want my users to be waiting on their configuration loading. I want them to get to the build as fast as they can. 
I wrote a few micro benchmarks and then used the pprof tool to find where I was accidentally allocating memory when I didn't need to. I absolutely love how easy it is to find out what's going on in my code without even leaving VS code. If you haven't checked out pprof yet, give it a look. Okay, go rocks, I'm done gushing now. Um, again, my name is Roxy Light, and you can check me out at 256lights.com. If you have any questions, come find me um, after the talk and after all the lightning talks are over. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to GoForCon for having me. Thank you.